When I was a kid, I went straight from the Tandy color computer to IBM's and IBM PC compatibles, so I never had the chance to mess with a Commodore Amiga system, and I'm really looking forward to trying one today. So, it's officially Amiga time on Vintage Geek. When I was a kid, I was really not even aware of the Commodore Amiga, other than seeing a few pictures of it in a few magazines that I had here and there. As I understand it, it was a very advanced machine for the time, and there's lots of different videos out there about the Amiga system, but the most interesting thing, and the thing that really drew me to the Commodore Amiga to really learn more about it, was the fact that apparently one of my favorite shows from when I was a kid on television, on the Nickelodeon network, was a show called Nick Arcade. And in Nick Arcade, at the end of the show, the kids would get to actually be inside of an arcade game. And it turns out that most of the work on the back end was done with a Commodore Amiga or multiple Commodore Amigas that made that happen. So I thought that was really cool and uh, it really made me want to play with one of these machines. I've never laid hands on one in my life. We actually got this particular Commodore Amiga from an eBay find. It's in very nice condition and I'm looking forward to powering it up and seeing what we can do with it today. The owner of this actually it was his original system so we did get everything with it including the original Commodore 10 84 video monitor. This monitor is capable of doing both digital RGB as well as uh, analog composite. We're going to use it in RGB mode today. The Amiga 2000 CPU itself is a nice rugged build machine. This one's in very clean condition overall. I'm pleased with it. Um, it does have the ability to have two three and a half inch floppy drives as well as a five and a quarter. This one does have the single three and a half inch as well as the built-in hard disk drive. We have the indicator here on the front panel. Now I read about the Amiga system. One of the things that was really ahead of its time was that the slots inside the Amiga were actually kind of an early version of what we now know as plug and play. They were automatically detected there was a number of different peripherals available for it. That seems like it's pretty obvious, but back in 1988, that would have been way ahead of its time. One of the things that a lot of the Amigas get used for, from what I've read, is a product called Video Toaster, which was a card that you could actually install in the Amiga and would allow you to run video in and out and you could actually do video mixing. And it was also used at a lot of cable companies to generate their actual on-screen guide channel. It would kind of have that scrolling display of text. Apparently a lot of that was done with Amiga computers. So this particular computer has a special place in history. And again, I've never actually used one of these, so I'm excited to do so today. The Commodore Amiga keyboard, to me, looks very similar to an IBM PC keyboard of the time. You have your full complement of keys. Everything looks laid out in a very similar way to a standard keyboard as we know it now. We're missing a few buttons in the center section, but we do have the delete key and the help key. We've got a full number pad. We've got all the function keys across the top and uh, the keyboard feels good. Um, you know, it feels like a relatively modern keyboard. I think it's going to be easy to use. The mouse that came with this Amiga is a two button mouse. It's got the, uh, the ball in it, but uh, it seems to be a pretty good build quality. It has a nice uh, range of motion and hopefully that will translate to its actual use. I think it's time for me to turn on this Commodore Amiga 2000 for the first time. It's now been about a month since we first shot the film for our Commodore Amiga piece here on Vintage Geek, and uh, a lot has happened since then. When we initially went through the system, we could not get it to boot up at all, uh, regardless of hard drive or otherwise. It turns out that the motherboard on that particular Commodore, either we had it in storage too long or the previous owner had never checked it, but unfortunately, the battery that was on the motherboard had leaked at some point and created a lot of damage on the motherboard itself. So there was a lot of uh, traces on the board that were not in great shape and most importantly the pin connectors for the actual CPU were pretty much damaged because of the corrosion. So I really was not able to put that back together. We ended up having to get another Commodore Amiga 2000 so that we could swap parts between the two of them. Now on the plus side, the Amiga that we ended up buying actually did have the video toaster system in it, complete with all of its cards and hard drive. I have no idea how any of that works. I'm going to save that for a future video. My primary concern here was getting our Amiga 2000 to at least boot up and run. And we have been able 
able to do that. Unfortunately, there are some caveats to this. One of them is that I was unable to get either of the hard drives to work. Both of these systems had a hard drive with their appropriate card to use with the hard drive. Neither of them worked, at least so far. I'm sure there are more things that I can do, diagnostic software, but again, I don't really have any familiarity with the Amiga system, so this is all new to me. In the meantime, what I have been able to get working is the Amiga 2000 itself, and to be able to load the Workbench program, which came with the Amiga. It's their little operating system. The other problem I found with both of these Amiga 2000s was that the inbuilt 3.5 inch floppy drive did not actually function on either unit. It would uh, work, you could put the disk in it and it would try to load, but ultimately the disk would have some kind of error, it would go into a weird screen with some red error messages. The only way I've been able to get this to boot reliably is to use this external Amiga floppy drive that came with the second one that we purchased, which is very lucky that we were able to get it because it has allowed us to be able to boot software. We do have a whole collection of Amiga software and I went through a lot of it before coming back to film this. And unfortunately, a lot of those discs are not reading. We're gonna have to get copies of those elsewhere. Luckily, we do have a collection of games that I have been able to get to function on this Amiga and we are looking forward to trying those out today. So I wanna take a quick look at Workbench itself and just kind of see what the operating system environment is like here on the Amiga 2000. So we're going to pop this one in first. One of the other things that I noticed right away about this particular Amiga 2000 and this particular disc of Workbench is that it seems to be set for a video mode that may not be the ideal one for this particular monitor. So the first thing that I did just kind of experimenting around with it is to open up this Workbench icon here. And if I look at the actual system, once this boots up here, there's several different things that you can do here. It looks like there's some disk utilities. You can add a monitor or do some things with memory that I'm not sure what those are. Let me look at the preferences. It's like we can choose things like input devices and pointers and serial ports. What else do we have? How about screen mode? Yeah, so right now it's in this high res interlaced mode for NTSC. I'm gonna go ahead and try to put this in just high res. So now with this different video mode, it looks much better on the monitor. Interestingly enough, on the capture, the other display modes seem to be kind of okay. The capture seems to now pick up some flickering in the icons in this mode, whereas the actual monitor seems perfectly fine. Must be just the difference between composite and RGB output, but in any case, it should work good enough to capture and look at now. There's all sorts of different options here in the preferences. You can look at the, the palette and the pointers. You know, if we look at some of these things here, we can look at pointer preferences, set the different uh, different colors and so forth. That's pretty cool. Let's see what eye control is. Looks like you can set timeouts and special command keys, mouse screen drag values. This whole thing is definitely reminding me of a Windows type environment. Early Windows, early Mac kind of has that feeling. Moving around is very similar. You can close windows using the, the top left-hand corner. If we look at uh, utilities, let's see what the clock looks like. Clock is not currently accurate, but that makes sense because I haven't actually set it. And this particular motherboard, I made sure to remove the battery before putting this back together so we didn't have another issue with the motherboard being destroyed. So obviously it's not saving the time right now. In any case, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is try to load some games. The first disc I wanna try today is actually, looks like it was a mailer sent to Amiga users. This is called Cover Disc 21, and I assume this would have been from some kind of Amiga fan club or something where someone would get a mailed disc every whatever the period of time was. This one I thought was interesting because it's got a game on it called Moonshine Racers, which I thought was pretty appropriate being in Tennessee and everything. Doesn't look like it's from a major publisher necessarily, but maybe it'll uh, show off some of the Amiga's capabilities and shareware form. So I thought we would give this a try today. Well, hello, Ike. Oh, you're watching out for Fat Sam the Sheriff. It's a full-time job, huh? I believe it. Oh, this is Ike's cousin, Billy Joe. Watch me put the pedal to the metal to get that moonshine to Tucker's bar. Oh, we got a dog here too. This is Ike's dog, Scraps. I sure hate that fat Sam. Oh, now we got the moonshine boss, Tucker. Good to know, he's gonna give me the best rate going. Oh, and th this is fat Sam the sheriff, okay? Don't mess with moonshine, boy. And Petula here, is she talking into a microphone? Is she like a lo local radio host or something? Rommel, the sheriff's dog? I eat moonshiners for breakfast. What a delightful cast of characters. Oh, we do have music. Yes, this looks pretty good. I'm not gonna lie, it's a little slow, <laughs> but the graphics look pretty decent. Looks kind of like an early Nintendo game. I guess maybe Super Nintendo kind of has that vibe to it. Reminds me of like a, of an early off-road game I used to play for the Nintendo. Got quite a few different obstacles here. Whoa. What is that, a tumbleweed? Oh, we gotta jump. Oh, there's there's a police officer. Yeehaw! Oh no, my truck's on fire. <laughs> if you crash that there motor again, I'll never get 
my precious moonshine. Is that all you have to care about at a time like this? My truck is ruined. <laughs> looks like I get to give this another shot. I mean, it certainly looks good, and it does move sl smoothly, albeit a little bit slowly. Oh no, they got me. I'm never gonna make it with the moonshine. All right, one more try. Don't give her any advice. He doesn't need to know the moonshiners are out on the road. Come on. <laughs> Wait, was that a barrel or something I just picked up? Is that the object? They are very aggressive. I do not want that moonshine running around. Ah, crash once more and you'll be fired. I feel like that's coming. I'm not gonna lie. All right, here we go. Last attempt. It's too bad they don't give you some kind of a shield or something for your car. It's really easy to take damage. I was kind of thinking maybe there would be like some kind of a weapon you could fire or something. Doesn't appear to be the case. Oh, things are going terribly now. <laughs> I am not a great moonshiner, it turns out. But uh, this game actually is a heck of a lot of fun. <laughs> Gotta give it some credit. There's a lot of different things going on on the screen. The music's jaunty. I don't know who actually wrote this game for the Amiga, but if this truly is just something that someone did as a side project, this is pretty cool. It shows off some of the capabilities of the system, and I'm pretty impressed with what I've seen so far. Next up, we're gonna see how the Amiga handles card games and games of chance with a, another floppy called Video Vegas. Looks like uh, this is gonna be a chance to play some typical Vegas games, maybe some blackjack, maybe some poker. I'm not sure exactly what it entails yet, but we're gonna pop it in and see what we can do. And this looks pretty cool so far. I love the neon signs. We've got blackjack, slots, poker, kino as well. Looks like you start out with $1,000, which is great. This looks like it's a mouse game, okay. Now let's start with some blackjack, see what that looks like. How many decks shall I open? I'm just going to go ahead and click deal. Definitely going to hit that. 18 seems like a good good number to stand on. Ah, just like real blackjack, I'm already losing. Right, we'll go ahead and hit. Hey, I won! Already doing better than the last time I was in Vegas. Overall though, the gameplay here is very smooth. No real latency or anything. It seems to make perfect sense. Colors look good. All the on-screen imagery looks good. The deck of cards looks great. You can change your bet. Looks like a pretty decent blackjack game. So now let's try our hand at a slot machine, see what it looks like on here. It's a good looking slot machine right there, well drawn. It looks great in color. It's a shame that we can't capture it in color because there's only, only the black and white output on the Amiga 2000. It's already set to bet one, so let's see what the handle pull looks like on this. Ha, saw the coin go into the slot. That's pretty cool. We got the sounds. And a loss. Starting out right. Let's just up the ante. I just click here. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. You can actually just click on the coin slot and it'll put your bet in. I'm betting three, this one's for all the marbles. Oh, gotta win eventually. What's the odds on this thing? Come on. Now see, that's that's real nice right there. You got all the coins coming down in the bin here. Everything looks great. The sound effects are nice. This is a nice game. All right, let's see what kind of hand of poker we can get here. A whole lot of nothing. All right, not much there. It's a little slow to actually deal out the cards, but not bad. Got a pair of 10s. We'll hold those, get rid of everything else. Not keep the 10s. Hey, I won $2 with two pair about the extent of my abilities, to be honest with you. But this does function about the same as any standard draw poker machine that you would find in Vegas. Just a little bit slower on drawing the cards. Obviously, they're not trying to take quite as much money from you on the Amiga as the Las Vegas casinos. Everything playability-wise seems to make perfect sense. I'm a fan so far. Next up, I wanna try a game called The Lost Dutchman Mine. Now this is one of those boxed copies that we have in our collection. This one looks like it is one of those games that has a multitude of things to do. So if I'm reading the back of this game box correctly, basically you're in an old west town and you kind of get to do different things. A little bit like an early open world concept. So I was really interested to check this out and kind of see what it's like with gameplay and everything. Well, I'm already impressed with the uh, opening screen on this. Looks like a real nice image of a crazed looking miner. Actually looks great in black and white. The music sounds cool too. So it looks like this game is actually from 1989. So this would have been uh, a couple years after this particular Amiga came out. Oh, look at this. Okay, got a little miner dude here. And we've got Mercantile and the SA office. Got a number of different options down here. It's telling us that it's Monday. It even tells us the temperature. Now, I'm not sure if I use the joystick. Oh, yep, I do, okay. That's cool. A little prospector is moving around on the screen. What happens if I go over here? Oh, it's got scrolling, okay, nice. 
There's the bank and the laundry and the newspaper. What else we got? There's the jail. I should probably try to stay out of there if possible. Oh, wow. Okay, so you leave the town and it actually brings you to a map. Eat your heart out, Red Dead Redemption. How far does this map go? Let's find the limitations of the Amiga 2000 today. So far, this is a fairly long road. We've ended at a natural terrain boundary, i.e. a mountain range someone placed there to ensure you don't go any further. Now, if I click somewhere here, will it... Oh, it'll show me the scenery. That's cool. Not a lot out here, but... Oh, and it's now 110 degrees, so it looks like I am hot. Why there's a... Actually, you can't see it in the black and white capture, but there's a red box around the uh, miner's face down in the menu below. I assume that means I need to get some water. Oh, yeah, my health isn't too great. Water's not looking good either. Some place I can eat around here? Well, we can definitely get something to drink in the saloon. Well, I can either choose from whiskey, sarsaparilla, or nothing. I guess uh, since I look very dehydrated, I'm gonna go with the sarsaparilla right now. Looks <laughs> like the health and water went up a little bit. Let's see what these different options are at the bottom. Okay, so that's our food items, which we don't have any of right now. Also don't have any tools. I don't have a gun. Thanks for letting me know. And we have $249. Let's see if we can buy something. Yeah, a lot of stuff to buy here. Just definitely buy some bread. Anti-venom, $150. Oof, guess I'm just gonna have to risk it. Canteen, $25, let's do that. And some beans. Well, food looks better. Water doesn't look great. Well, now that I have a canteen, maybe I can go to this river. Uh -huh. What if I... Okay, so it did automatically fill the canteen when I went to the river. That's pretty clever. Looks like we've entered nighttime, and the clock is moving very quickly now. I've gone back to being in red health status. Can I get back to the town? <laughs> I think that uh, I'm starting to run. Oh no! <laughs> and so ends the life of yet another poor prospector who, like so many before him, died looking for but never finding the lost Dutchman mine. Well, that didn't go so well for me, but I was technically learning how to play the game for the first time. Very cool though. I love what they've done here, especially considering the age of this game and showing that it's an early open world concept. Definitely a lot of things borrowed for games in the future that came from this kind of concept. And I could actually see myself playing this game a lot more to try to kind of figure out everything about it. Next up, I want to take a look at a sports title for the Amiga 2000. And normally I don't really get into sports games. I'm not really a sports person, but in this particular case, it was one of those box titles that I found that actually did load. It was voted the best sports game, according to the sticker on the front, so I feel like it's got some potential. According to the back, it's a whole new ball game. It looks like there's some pretty decent graphics in this game for a baseball particular title, so let's take a look at it and see how it looks. Now this one has one of those fun features of games that used different types of copy protection. Instead of having something digitally on the disc, they basically force you to use a physical paper spin dial type of representation to put in the appropriate information for the copy protection. This was so you didn't just take your game to your friend's house and give him a copy of the floppy and let him play the game. He would actually have to borrow the entire box and all the paperwork in it in order to get this particular code. So the code wheel looks like this, and basically it's three spinners that you spin around to match what the screen is asking you for. Use the Hardball 2 code wheel to line up Willie Dr. O in 1967 and enter the number shown in the window labeled G. It looks like that's actually 66. Now this is an accolade title from 1989, looks like. That was a really nice animation on that pitch. Got some credits here. Distinctive Software Inc. All right, so we've got a number of different options here to start with, and it looks like you can edit the teams. Looks like this has a lot of cool features. You can select the visiting team, the home team, and the stadium. So right now, it looks like the visiting team is the Distinctive Stars, and the home team is the Accolade Aces. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit Play New Game, see what happens here. Field's looking good. Looks like we got a full house crowd-wise, ready to play some baseball. All right, we got our scoreboard here. The bullpen is empty for both the home and the visitors. It's got kind of our list of players here. Is that look, looking good? And I guess you must just have to hit the... Oh, okay. Play ball. They have the entire national anthem in here. Pretty impressive. I feel like someone that was on the programming team said, you know what, we could do this whole thing. And someone else said, okay. Ah, here come the players. Top of the first. Okay, it looks like I must be pitching. When I'm hitting the arrow key, it's affecting the type of pitch. I guess I hit enter. And then hit uh, shift and... <laughs> you have to figure out how to actually 
swing at the ball. That, I feel like that's gonna be a really important uh, point of this game. So, gives you your swing choices. Press enter to make your swing. Ah, it's the shift key. Now I at least know how to swing. Yay! <laughs> It's a line drive! I'm basically playing for both teams at the moment, and I'm doing terribly on both sides. This is exactly how it would be if I was really playing baseball. I did get a player on base though, so you know, that's, that's something. But this seems like a pretty full-featured baseball game. I'm not a baseball game player on any system, but it looks like you've got everything here. You can customize your team, you can customize the rosters, essentially get to control both teams by using a different side of the keyboard, so it's pretty well set up for a two-player game, I would think. Players look good, the animations look good. It's a good looking game. I could see why this would have won some awards. Definitely shows off, again, the power of the Amiga, and I continue to be impressed by how the Amiga performs with all of these games. Well, that's it for today's Amiga 2000 activities. I would say this one was definitely worth the wait, even though we had to go through some extra steps to get another Amiga 2000 and ultimately make one that completely works. And even so, there are still some things we need to do to this Amiga to get the original hard drive working, get some of the peripherals working and definitely want to find out more about Video Toaster and do some work with that. In the meantime, it would really help us out a lot here on the channel if you'd please like and subscribe. That really helps us as we grow here at Vintage Geek Museum. And if you want to get a cool t-shirt for one of your favorite brands with the Vintage Geek on it, be sure to check out our merch store. The link is in the description. We've got all the info on how you can buy these great shirts and support the Vintage Geek Museum. I'm Aaron, and that's been Vintage Geek. And in doing so, I never had a chance to work with an... Starting over. So, it's Amiga time on Vintage Geek. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's officially Amiga time on Vintage Geek. <laughs> it's officially time for an Amiga adventure on Vintage Geek. <laughs>